Question. Whether lust or corruption habitually prevalent be consistent with the truth of grace? Answer. This is a hard question. There are difficulties in it, and it may be it is not precisely to be determined. I am sure we should be very careful what we say on such a question, which determines the present and eternal condition of the souls of men. Suppose we retain something of what was spoken and stayed in a lust or corruption so habitually prevalent, because this is the foundation of our present inquiry, I shall bring what I have to say upon this question to a few heads, that they may be remembered. I say then first, it is the duty of every believer to take care that this may never be his own case practically. We shall meet with straits enough and fears enough and doubts enough about our eternal condition, though we have no lust nor corruption habitually prevalent. Therefore I say it is the duty of every believer to take care this may never be his case. David did so. Psalm 19:12 and 13. Who can understand his errors, he says? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. He acknowledges his errors and sins, and prays for cleansing, purifying, pardon. But for presumptuous sins, sins with a high hand, and every habitual corruption which has something of presumption, Lord, keep back thy servant from them, he says. The apostle's caution is to the same purpose. Hebrews 12:15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up. There is a root of bitterness in every one, which I look upon as a corruption in some measure habitual, if it springs up to greater defilement. And I beseech you, brethren, beg of God for your own souls and mind, that we may be careful this never be our case. Secondly, the second thing I would observe is this, whatever may be said concerning its consistency with grace, it is certainly consistent with peace. I wish we could remember what description was given before of this prevalent corruption, that we might consider the things now applied to it. Here, though, I would be as tender as of the apple of mine eye in these things. I will not fear as to say this, that the peace which any one has concurring with a prevalent corruption is security, not peace. I know men may be at great peace under prevalent corruptions and live upon good hopes that they shall be accepted with God, that it shall be well with them in the latter end, and that they shall have power one time or other against this corruption and will leave it when it is seasonable, and strive against it more than they have done. But all such peace is but security. Under prevalent corruption there is a drawing back, for I would state the matter thus. A person who is a professor, and is kept up to duties and obedience till some lust has gotten strength, by constitution, temptations, or occasions of life, and has drawn him off from his former renovation and walking with God, there is then a drawing back. Now, says the Apostle, if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Hebrews 10.38 And when God has no pleasure according to the several degrees of backsliders, it may be that is meant of final apostasy. He does not intimate anything that is a ground of peace to that soul. So Isaiah 57.17 For the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth, and hid myself from him. If there be an incurable iniquity of covetousness or any other iniquity, whether manifest to us or not, God is angry and does hide himself from us. I pray, brethren, let us examine our peace, and if we find we have a peace that can maintain its ground and station under prevalent corruption, trust no more to that peace. It will not stand us instead when it comes to a trial. Thirdly, the third thing I would say is this that if a prevalent corruption be not inconsistent with the truth of grace, it is certainly inconsistent with the true exercise of grace. It is not indeed inconsistent with the performance of duties, but it is inconsistent with the true exercise of grace and the performance of duties. It is often seen and known that persons under prevalent corruption will multiply duties, thereby to quiet conscience and to compensate God for what they have done amiss. Persons may multiply prayers, follow preaching, and attend to other duties when they use all these things, 
through the deceitfulness of sin, but as a cloak unto some prevailing corruption. But in all those duties there is no true exercise of grace. The true determination of this question depends upon a right exposition of 1 John 2.15. If we could understand that verse, it determines this point. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. There is a question whether prevalent corruption be inconsistent with true grace. I know the words may have this construction. If any man do make the world his chiefest good, if any man put the world in the place of God, then the love of the Father is not in him. He has either received no love from God, or he has no love to God as a Father in Christ. But indeed the apostle speaking unto believers, I am apt to think, speaks not of the whole kind, but degrees. If there be a prevalency of love of the world, there is no prevalency of the actings of the love of the Father. That they do not concern the habitual principles of the love of the world and of the love of the Father, but the prevailing actings of the one and the other. And accordingly it may be said of all other graces whatsoever, that where there is a prevalency of the acting of sin, there is a suspension of the exercise of grace. Brethren, if any of us have been under the power of prevalent corruption, I will be still tender and speak what ought to be received and believed, whether people do or not. It is much to be feared we have lost all our prayers and hearing, because we have not had a true exercise of grace in them. Some exercise there may be, but a due and true exercise of grace will be laid asleep by prevalent corruption. And therefore let us take heed of prevalent corruption, as we would take heed of losing all things that we have wrought, our praying, hearing, suffering, charity, for lack of a due exercise of grace in them. Fourthly, I shall grant this, that spiritual life may be in a swoon when the spiritual man is not dead. There is a kind of deliquium of the spirits, called swooning away, that may befall believers, which suspends all acts of life when yet the man is not dead. So I say, though I should see a man through the prevalency of corruption, have all the evidences of a spiritual life cast into a swoon, yet I will not presently conclude the spiritual man is dead. Take the case of David, from the time of his great fall and transgression in the manner of Uriah until the coming of Nathan the prophet. Persons are generally inclined to believe that the spiritual life was in a swoon when the spiritual man was not dead. His fall, as an honest man said, beat the breath out of his body, and he lay a long time like a man dead by reason of that power which one signal sin left in his soul. And take that as a great instance that one sin, not immediately taken off by great humiliation, leaves great and even habitual inclinations in the soul to the same sin, so that some ascribed it unto the corruption of our nature. For it is a great and difficult question in divinity how one particular sin, as the sin of Adam was, should bring in habitual corruption to our nature, to which some answer thus, that any one single moral act performed with a high hand has great obliquity in it, disposing our whole nature to corruption. David, by that single act of flagrant wickedness, did continue in it for so long a space of time, till Nathan came and administered some good spirits to him that relieved him out of his swoon. Therefore I say that I will not judge a person to be spiritually dead, whom I have judged formerly to have had spiritual life, though I see him at present in a swoon, as to all evidences of the spiritual life. And the reason why I will not judge so is this, because if you judge a person dead, you neglect him, you leave him. But if you judge him in a swoon, though never so dangerous, you use all means for the retrieving of his life. So ought we to do to one another and our own souls. Fifthly, there is a prevalency of sin that is inconsistent with true grace, which may befall those who have been professors. So the Apostle doth plainly declare, Romans 6.16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. There is such a servant of sin as puts a man into a contrary state. Sixthly, I shall add but one thing more, and that is this. There may be a corruption, sin, or lust habitually prevalent as to whatsoever evidence is a person in whom it is or others can discern, and yet the root of the matter, the root of spiritual life, be notwithstanding in the person. Suppose, then, there be such a prevalency that the soul judges to be habitual. How shall we know whether the root of the matter be in such a person or no? 
If the soul has anything left of spiritual life, there will be something of vital operations in that soul. Now, the vital operations that give it evidence that the soul is not absolutely slain by prevalent corruption are opposition and humiliation. So long as the soul, though it be never so much captivated, is conscious to itself of a sincerity in the opposition it makes, there is an evidence of a vital operation, as likewise where it is constant in its humiliation on that account. But if it be further inquired how it may be known that this humiliation is sincere, I answer, it cannot be known from its vigor and efficacy, for that overthrows the question. For if the opposition was vigorous and effectual, it would break the power of lust and corruption, so that it would be no more prevalent. But two ways it may be known. First, by its constancy. If the root of the matter be still in us, there will be a constant opposition to every act of any prevailing corruption whatsoever. I do not speak about violent temptations, but ordinary cases in which I know not whence we should conclude the root of the matter is in that man who does not make a sincere opposition to every instance of the acting of prevalent corruption. If a man can pass over one and another instance of prevalent corruption without any humiliation for it, the Holy Sovereign God show him grace and mercy. But it is to me the way of a serpent upon a stone. I see it not. I know it not. Number two, it is sincere if it be from its proper spring, that is, if the opposition be not from conviction, light, or conscience only, but from the will of the poor sinner. I would do otherwise. I would have this sin destroyed. I would have it rooted out that it should be no more in me. My will lies against it, however it has captivated my affections and disturbed my course. This is all I dare say upon this question that there may be an habitual prevalency of corruption, which may seem so to them in whom it is, is also to those whose converse with them, and yet the root of the matter be in them. We may know the root of the matter by the acting of spiritual life, and opposition going before, and humiliation coming after. We may know the sincerity of these vital actings by their constancy and by their spring, if we are constant in them, and if they arise from our wills. Delivered April 19th, 1677.